Hi everyone, hope you had good lunch. Now the next session is on using AIML to process automated test results from OpenQA from Tim Flink. All the best. All right, um, well, as you said, I'm Tim. Uh, I work for Red Hat on, uh, with Fedora Quality, and uh, you know, that's just what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, just before I get started, I am a really big believer in informal uh, presentations. If you have questions, please ask them. Um, I was a little unclear on, and I'm still, I'm gonna find out, you know, whether I've put too much information, not enough information. So if you have questions, please feel free to, you know, raise your hand. If I don't see you, please interrupt me. Um, that's fine. I don't really care. The whole part, the whole point of this is to uh, communicate, and sometimes that's the best way. So what I'm looking to do is um, do a bit of an introduction, um, talk a bit about uh, neural networks, um, go into the experiments that or the experiment that we've done. Um, where we're looking to go in the future and leave some time at the end for uh, some questions. So, out of curiosity, is anyone coming in here hoping that GPT was going to be making the presentation? Just me? <laughs> I was kind of hoping, but yeah, it didn't actually work. Um, so, just to kind of get started because it's a, you know, a very popular term right now, um, and in my opinion, there's a bit of a decent amount of misunderstanding of uh, what it all can cover. Um, what I am looking to talk about is, you know, in general, an experiment that we did um, to figure out whether or not it's going to even be possible to be using AML to do triage. Um, and it is, in particular, using data from tests that are visual. Um, and I just want to make that distinction because a lot of testing is done primarily in the text domain. Um, and the techniques that are done there don't necessarily work with um, visually oriented tests and vice versa. Um, just to be clear, the, it's not about, like, I, we haven't created this magical tool to automatically triage test failures. Maybe someday, but we aren't actually to that point yet. Um, and nor will, in my opinion, what I'm about to talk about, be ever be able to completely replace human triagers. Um, this is, in my opinion, again, a good way to make people more efficient, um, to help make their jobs easier, make their lives easier. Um, but at the end of the day, it's going to always rely on some form of human expertise in order to actually get the job done. So uh, the system that these tests are running in um, is OpenQA. Uh, OpenQA is a system that's primarily based on computer vision. Um, a lot, what it's really good at is um, it takes a screenshot of a machine that's running and it has a little picture and it, you basically tell it, look on the screen anywhere for this picture of, you know, for example, a button. If you find this picture or this little snippet somewhere in the screen, move the mouse over there, click on it. And you create your test cases based off of that. Um, and consequently, a lot of the information that comes out of it is visual. Um, yes, there is some text that, can, that comes out of it, but it's primarily in the forms of uh, screenshots and it also produces videos of the entire run. Um, the system itself uh, started with SUSE. Uh, as, I as far as I know, it's almost the way they do all of their automated testing. Um, but it is uh, in Fedora now, and it is a critical part of our release process. Basically, every update in Bodhi goes through um, OpenQA, and at this point, every, th every th Rawhide update goes through OpenQA as well. So. There, it, it runs a lot of tests. Um, so the idea, this particular idea, um, this started sometime last year. There was a chronic issue within OpenQA where tests would fail unexpectedly um, when Firefox, which was being used for part of the test, would just quit. And the test would fail because, you know, Firefox quit. And um, it was, you know, we tried looking into it. Um, it took a long, it took a while, at least at the, when this started there was not a, uh, we hadn't found the root cause. Um, so we had a whole bunch of tests that were failing for reasons that we weren't testing for, which is not terribly useful. So the people who were doing the triage would go through, they'd recognize that um, this test had failed for a relatively common reason and would mark it as for rescheduling and the test would be rerun until it either passed or failed from an issue that wasn't this, you know, Firefox just decided to stop working. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, 
you know, something that was you know, causing the system to stop or anything like that, but it was overhead on the people doing the triage. And you know, they usually have better things to do with their time than deal with a common issue that hopefully we can find a tool to you know, work around. So we came up to this question of can we create, can we train uh, a machine learning system to detect that particular crash and then automatically do the rescheduling? But this kind of comes to a question because, you know, I was talking about this issue last year. As it turned out, as I was starting in this, the bug was magically fixed. I'm not sure anyone particularly found this bug, you know, what the root cause was, but there was an update and they stopped working. Or, I mean, they, they stopped crashing. Um, so, you know, there's a very valid question of, well, why do we care? You know, this is no longer a valid issue. Why is there a point in continuing with this? Um, because, you know, the issue's been fixed. It's not going to be of direct use. And it's an easy answer. Uh, it created a rare situation where creating the data set is cheap. By and large, when you work with machine learning, the really expensive part is creating your data set. Um, and uh, something that I've learned through doing a whole bunch of machine learning is if you don't have to create your, don't, your own data set, don't. It's a lot of work and it's not fun. Um, and you know, at that point, you know, there was a real question of, can this even work? Can we look at the screenshots coming out of OpenQA and you know, get enough information to start doing triage work? So this was a cheap way to create the data set to set up for the experiment um, that didn't you know, involve me you know, harassing the triagers to help me tag you know, different runs until they stopped responding to my emails. So, does that, I mean, at this point, does that make sense? You know, it, like it's set up as, you know, we have this recurring issue, um, and it's, it's visual. I guess I haven't gotten much further than that, but any questions at this, at this point? All right, so um, we did try a couple of things. Uh, I'm generally a believer that, you know, more simpler is more better, um, but it didn't work. Um, you know, tried to do OCR on the pictures and run that through a classifier, and that failed spectacularly, so I'm not even, I didn't write slides for it. Um, but, you know, it was worth trying because it's the easiest possible thing. Um, but to get into some background on, you know, what I ended up doing is, uh, so artificial neural networks, um, the, the way they work, it's, you know, it was really inspired by how, you know, the human brain works. You have a bunch of interconnected, you can call them neurons, that work together to remember and process information. Um, it's uh, generally made up of multiple layers, at least modern ones, but the concept itself is not really that new. It was first proposed in the late 19th century, um, and the first computer-based neural network was done in the 50s. Um, and as time went on, you know, there, you know, it would be popular in research, and then people would realize, at least in the 50s, that they didn't have the compute power to do it, so it would die off for a while. Then, you know, people started talking about it more in, you know, the 70s, and then it kind of died off for the same reason. Um, the use of neural networks really didn't start taking off until we had, uh, you know, the growth of, in particular, GPUs. And the ability to do a whole lot more math a lot more quickly that made this theoretical, oh, we can make a computer think, you know, work like a brain into something that is a lot more practical and, you know, doable. Um, roughly... Oh, this is, I'm trying to think, sorry, I'm trying to realize, I'm remembering that this is being uh, recorded. So that shows up. And, you know, from, like I said, this is a very simple diagram. Um, I don't have the time to go too deeply into this, but the basic idea is you have, you know, this in particular is one, but you have your input layer and your output layer. Um, each of these would generally represent one bit. Um, and you present your input, it is connected to all of the different layers in between um, through various techniques, and then you get an output. Um, is the very, very high level of how a neural network would work, or does work. In terms of the types, uh, the, what's called a multi-layer perceptron is very much like the diagram I just showed. It, is, it was meant to model you know, how, the, how the brain works and how the neurons in the brain work. Um, it is still very heavily used, but it is, tends not to be the primary thing. It tends to be a final layer trying to gather stuff together to produce a 
at least in the term in a classifier sense, a single output. Um, another is recurrent neural networks. Um, it's usually used for more for natural language processing, um, and it, it, where you have things of indeterminate length. And uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, this is, you know, they really became popular for image classification. Um, of, you know, give it a set of, in, of images, and, uh, you know, say, you know, uh, and, a, and a set of categories, you know, can the neural network correctly classify this image as a dog, or, you know, this image as a bus, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and that was uh, state of the art in terms of image classification until about 2019. Um, and the stuff passed then, you know, this is a good question of why, I mean, I'm not, I'm not covering it because I ended up using a CNN. Um, and the reason for it is data. All the stuff that is newer, um, the stuff that is, has been state of the art since 2019, requires like millions of pieces of data in order to um, get that performance. And that's, you know, getting back to the theme of this was an experiment, we wanted to do it cheaply, millions of data points was not an option. So a classifier, um, like I said, it's, you know, given an input, you know, what class does it belong to? Um, I think of it as very similar to a CAPTCHA. So, you know, you get the, you, we've all seen these things. It's like, you know, select all the images with crosswalks. So this is, you know, using a human as a classifier. You know, is this, does this image have a, have a sidewalk? You know, yes or no, you know, go on. So each one of these uh, pictures, you know, can be classified as contain sidewalk or does not contain a, a sidewalk. Um, and you know, using neural networks is one potential implementation for uh, an image classifier. So, uh, you know, getting into you know, like machine learning, you know, from a very, from the, the high level parts of this is, you know, you show it a bunch of examples, you know, it's supposed to learn from that and then be able to replicate what basically what you showed it. Um, and you know, that's how a neural network also works, is you give it a bunch of data um, and the correct answers. You know, it learns from, you know, this was correct, that wasn't correct, and eventually you will, well, you hope you end up with something that um, can repeat what you've taught it. Uh, a, a common term, um, deep neural networks, it just means more layers. More layers, more computation, um, and that's really what it comes down to. Uh, there's no strict definition um, from what I've seen. Generally, it's three or more layers to be considered deep, um, but that's you know, about that. Uh, my very quick overview of neural networks makes sense. Does anyone have any questions? Good. Um, One second. Wait for the microphone. I forgot about that. Could you go back a slide? You were saying it's it's multiple layers. Does that mean multiple passes of the same? Um, no, it is, go, is that multiple passes to determine the the image to classify the image or? It would. I mean, this in retrospect, I probably could have found a better diagram. Um, so in this case, this is a network with three layers. You have your input layer, one hidden layer, and an output layer. So it just adds, like, more layers would add, like, more, you know, if it was fully connected or something. It just, it's, so it's more process, more steps before it finishes. So it goes from, you know, the input layer to the next layer to the next layer, and eventually you get to your output. So it's not more passes, but it's adding more steps before you get from beginning to end. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Regarding this diagram, regarding this diagram uh, each point in the first hidden layer would point to all of the points of the consecutive hidden layers. For, for, for a fully connected network, yes. Um, so this is a simplistic diagram. It, in this case, yes, in, there are cases where you would use that, but when that stopped being state-of-the-art probably in the 90s. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a good way to think of it, but it doesn't always happen unless mm -hmm. you specify it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other questions? 
All right, so let's get into the experiment. Um, all right, the data set. Uh, like I said before, uh, one of the big advantages of looking at this particular problem is it was easy and cheap to create the data set. You know, we had a, uh, an issue with the tests, and if, we saw, if the triagers saw that test, they would reschedule it. So making a couple quick assumptions, um, that assuming that all the jobs that failed for this reason were rescheduled, and assume that um, anything that failed and was rescheduled was due to this issue. Are there, did I probably catch a few that weren't supposed to be in there? Do I miss a few? Yes, but over this time period that it holds true enough to produce a valid data set. From that, it's easy to just, you know, point, you know, some code at the OpenQA instance, download all the pictures, download all the, um, uh, the, the videos, and we then have our data set that is categorized into, you know, two sets. We have jobs that were supposed to be rescheduled and jobs that weren't. Um, and again, you know, I'm harping on the cost because that's one of the biggest things is uh, I didn't have to go to the triage, the people doing the triage and after they described the issue and confirmed that I understood, they didn't have to sit there for hours and hours mark, say, giving me like, okay, so this job number, this job number, this job number, this job number, those were the ones that you were looking for. Um, so the, the human, co the cost in terms of human time was uh, very much minimized. Uh, I gathered all the jobs uh, from August 30th to September, uh, September 13th of last year, grabbed all the screenshots, um, any text that was produced, and the video. Ended up being a little over 31,000 jobs. The full data set is 208 gigabytes. Um, eliminating the data brings it down to about half at 102 gigabytes of mostly pictures. Um, so getting, you know, using a, a convolutional neural network, it doesn't have really a sense of time. You have to give it all of the data at the same time. So I can't just feed it the first screenshot, the second, third, fourth, so on. Um, and what I ended up doing was creating a composite screenshot. Um, just as I'm going, I'm going to go back and forth, but basically this. So this is, you can kind of see the different screens. This is from a part of the job, these are all the screenshots it produced. Here's the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, so on. So this ends up being one image um, that contains all of the uh, screenshots and I can feed that into the network all at once. Um, just getting into some te technicalities, um, did some subsampling in general with neural networks. If you give it something that's rare, I mean this was, I think we were seeing maybe 1% fail I think it was out of the 31,000 jobs, I think it was 900. So I mean, it was 1 30th. Um, if you just feed that ratio into a network while you're training it, it's not going to do very well because it can just always say false and you know, 29 30ths of the time, it's going to be correct. So um, I just you know, limited the, I took all of the, the samples where it was supposed to be rescheduled um, and I think I left it at a ratio of about five to one. So for every job that needed to be rescheduled, I took one, or I took five random ones that didn't, um, and created the data set out of that. Um, left the data set as 80% for training, so you know, took 80% of that to, to do the training, um, did the testing on the, rest, uh, the remaining 20%, um, and used a three-layer uh, deep CNN to do the classification. Um, and again, this is the, uh, the composite screenshot that gets fed in. Um, hopefully this representation will at least not be too, too confusing. So you were talking about, uh, what was it Jeff, you, were, you asked about um, you know, adding the layers. So in this case, we, there's, this is one layer, this is a second layer, this is a third layer, um, and this ends up being uh, four, three and four. I mean, it's, it, we, we can get into technicalities. Um, <laughs> it's so so basically it's a, the, this last one is dimensionality reduction so this is a hundred this is a vector of length 100 and I needed to get I need to get binary answer so it has to be brought down to one so that's what this last one is is dimensionality reduction from 100 to one um, which is why I was saying it's like is it another it depends on how you look at it um, the I'm not going to spend too much time harping on the, the, the specifics of what all of this um, is doing, but it is using convolution to 
um, you know, steadily you know, go through and convolve the, the data that is in, that starts in the layer and uh, you know, essentially do feature extraction, you know, trying to extract information out of it um, and then move on to the next layer. Um, the, uh, you can class, you can, it was left, uh, you know, purposely without some specific, uh, there's a parameter search space um, that I left for this. Um, you know, the different sizes of the layers, um, the, the fully connected, that last part where it, it's kind of pulling the information together and eventually reducing the dimensionality. Um, what size of the kernel it's using for convolution. Um, the max pooling has to do with um, trying to uh, keep it from having all of the information in one part of where it's looking. Um, it will take, it would take longer than I have to, to really go through it. Um, it's, it's a commonly used part, it's part of almost every CNN. But uh, I did a grid search of all of that, um, which is 432 runs. Um, and I just want to make a bit of an aside. There's been some conversation on some of the Fedora lists about, you know, do we really need GPUs? Um, and I want to point at this where this is the same machine. I ran the same, same network on the same data and it took four minutes to run with the GPU and it took 24 minutes to run on just the CPU. Um, so it is dramatic. Um, and even just with four minutes per you know, run, that still took more than a day running constantly. And it's not, I mean, it's a 13th Gen i7 with a 24 gig 3090. It's, I mean, in terms of what people use for machine learning, it's tiny, but it, it's, you know, that, I think that says more about the clusters they use for training stuff like GPT, <laughs> which costs millions of dollars. Um, but it's still, it's the, it just sort of bring home, you know, why, you know, we might really need to have some accelerated option for, for, for doing the AI ML in Fedora. Um, and, you know, more of an illustration of, like I said, you know, the, the concept of neural network has been around for a while. It didn't really take off until we had machines that could do that much extra math very quickly. Leaving aside the last one that took hours, um, do you have an estimate of the power consumption of the four minutes versus 24 minutes? I, I imagine I could go look at it, but I don't off the top okay. of my head. I'd be interested to know, because, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my suspicion is that it takes, le me guessing, this is gut, is that it's less energy with the GPU, but I can, I can figure it out. I don't off the top of my head, though. Um, so one question, two slides before, if you were to not take the um, subset, subsample, mm -hmm. if you were to just take composite images, how much, how many composite images would you still require to get 80% efficacy throughout for one single failure? I don't understand what you mean by 80% so, of efficacy. I don't understand. No, so for example, if you're training for 80%, right, uh, and you subsample the data set, if you were to not subsample. I'm st I don't know, 80% of what? I don't understand. Uh, you subsample the uh, split, right, to 80 to 20, 80% 80 of training. No, that's, 20%. Um, no, I, I subsampled, I, don't, I can go check the code. I don't remember off the top of my head. I believe it's five to one. Ah, so there okay. are five uh, jobs that did not need to be rescheduled for every one that did need to be rescheduled. Yeah. So okay. that, that, and that's just for training purposes, if it's too rare, like I said, you can just, the, the and I've done this, um, where the neural network will just return zero for everything and you'll end up with like 90 something percent yes. accuracy because 90% of the jobs were zero. So yes. that, that's where the subsampling comes from. Huh. Um, in terms of the split, it's just 80%. So then from, you know, took the, the original, subsampled it so there was a five to one ratio of not rescheduled to rescheduled. rescheduled yes. And then from that, from that data set, took 80% of those and that was used for training and the remaining 20% were used for testing. Makes sense, okay. Okay, and uh, go forward please. And uh, so if I understand correctly, it took 28 hours to completely train the network? No, this is, it took four minutes to, to uh, with the GPU it took four minutes. Um, this is, so like, but I can run it with different parameters. So this, this is just with try, all, like to do an exhaustive search of this entire 
list with uh, two tries each was 432 iterations. Okay, and like the 20, uh, 28 hours mm -hmm. is uh, the number is the to, total to, time to exhaustively search through that parameter list to see which one performed the best, which combination oh. of parameters performed oh, the best. Oh, I see, I see, okay, okay. So if you wanted to train, if you then got through this whole experiment and you wanted to so if you got through this whole experiment, the idea after the 28 hours, you know which neural network configuration is the most efficient for the task. So if you want to train it on a different failure, you wouldn't have to go through the 28 hours again. You could just... Wouldn't even have to go through the four minutes. Okay. I mean, it, once you have the network trained, um, you can just run it on more. Um, so that four minutes is to train on the 80% and then test on the, the 20%. So I don't know off the top of my head. I think it would be... Yeah, I'm not even sure. I don't want to try to do the math in my head. It's much quicker um, once it's actually trained. Any other questions? All right. So uh, OpenQA is configured such that the screenshots are all 1024 by 768. Um, when I did the first try, I took all, you know, did a composite screenshot and then shrank it down to the same size of 1024 by 768. The results were so bad that I did not write them down. Um, and actually, at that point, I was convinced this was not going to work. And I'm like, all right, let's just try this one more time. Let's double the resolution um, and uh, shrank it down the composite screenshot, which could be you know, eight times the size of the original, but shrink it down to 2048 by 1536. Um, when I did that and then did search the parameter space, it was getting really good numbers. Um, Crap. All right. I was going to put a slide in here on precision and recall. Um, so the, the first thing about accuracy is basically how many, so it got you know, almost 98% of them correct. Um, but uh, the more important things um, is going through the precision, um, you know, did it find, I'm trying to think of the, um, uh, how, many of the did it, how many of the true positives did it find? And then recall starts looking into how many false positives were there. Um, the, this is much easier to, to explain if you include the diagram that I forgot. Uh, but um, suffice it to say, it, it did well. It is not, get it, it is not showing too many false uh, positives, um, nor is it showing uh, missing things, like things that should have been a positive that uh, um, should have been a negative. Um, which, in my mind, is important for this use case because if we are trying to rely on something um, to, to say, yes, you know, this is a certain, this is triaged in a certain way, this is not triaged in a certain way, you know, if you get a whole bunch of false negatives or false positives, no one's going to trust it and it's going to cost them more mental energy than if we hadn't done it in the first place. Um, these are. That, I, okay, so there's a typo in my slide. Um, these are the configuration values that yielded the best results. The kernel size is supposed to be two. I'm not sure why it says 6, 62,000, um, but that value is supposed to be two. Um, and, you know, getting through, it's like, you know, that's great. You know, we have, you know, something that's 98% accurate, but, you know, how, like, is this useful? Is this something that can be applied elsewhere? And, um, this is a way of saying not really. Like I said, this was an experiment to see if you know, this, any of this is feasible. But um, as an analogy, you know, it's like if I have this network and I spent all this time to train it on pictures and I want it to identify crosswalks. You know, that's wonderful. But the next capture I get, I need to identify buses. It's not gonna find anything. So that's kind of where we're at. This experiment was you know, an analogy to pointing it at OpenQA and say, find all the sidewalks which is great if you're looking for sidewalks, but that's not all the time. Um, and um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, one of the potential issues is that um, because I had to use the large screenshots, it takes a lot of memory on the GPU. Um, with the 24 gigs of uh, memory I had in that GPU, I could only do the images, I think it was four or five in a batch. Um, and batch sizes are usually larger than that. Um, but there's only so much memory. Do you have a question? Yeah. And for, for the images, 
of loading the images from the system RAM is too slow for this application. Folding? Uh, off offloading the images from system memory is like if you don't it, have if enough. It's not, it has to be on the GPU in order to run, in order to get that time increase from 24 minutes to four, mm -hmm. it has to fit within the, the graphics card's memory. Okay, thank you. So just curious, on the composite image things, as the, the human behind the curtain here, I happen to know that in classifying these failures, all you actually needed was the failure image. Did you try running the experiment just using, because I believe from the API you can get only the image that the test failed on. I don't know if you looked into that. I did not know that was a thing. Yeah, it knows. Um, it circles it in red in the web UI, and I believe from the API data you can figure out this is the, Im this is the one the test failed on, and then run it on that. So. It, I mean, I could, we could, no, I did not know that was okay. possible. So no, I did not run yeah. that. Um, I did not know that was a, a thing you could do with OpenQA. Okay. That OpenQA would tell Next you. time we do it, we can do it yep. that way. <laughs> It'd be interesting to try. My suspicion is that would not work. Um, because, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, I've talked about all this OpenQA triages. It's mostly you. Yeah. So my. it has been using they, them pronouns for me so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. <laughs> um, the. My, in, my understanding of the, the time period that this was happening is it's not, you needed more information than just the one that it failed on? No, for this one, Jen, for this one, Unless, failure, you would, you would know from the like, screenshot. From the screenshot, you, don't, you didn't yeah. get any more context of um, what yeah, job because it the, was, the what The failed was screenshot would always be, you know, oh, it just dropped back to a command prompt and there's a bunch of Xorg server blah there. That's the thing the network would have wanted to figure out. But and there are other cases where that wouldn't work, though. Okay. Just for this specific failure, and it probably would have done, I think. We can, it'd be interesting to try. Like I said, my, my in, and I don't want to, I mean, we can get into the details of it. I don't think that would work, okay. uh, is, we'll my, is my instinct, because I don't think there's enough context in that one image to be able to tell, you know, reschedule, don't. But it'd be worth trying, because it'd be a lot less computationally expensive. Yeah. Okay. There's another question. This kind of question for Adam. Are there uh, things that are successes that look like that failure screen for other kinds of tests? That's a question for Adam. I don't. <laughs> it's an, he, he asked, uh, are there things that look like success? Are there things that would look like the failure screen but would be a success in another test? Again, I think in this specific case, probably no. So yeah, as I, I said in the previous question, but just in case anyone didn't catch it, in this specific case, when the test failed, what we would normally see is instead of something in a web browser, which is what the test was expecting to see, we would suddenly drop to a console and there would be, you know, when an, this was actually running X for stupid reasons. So you would have the X server output on the console and probably like a cut off stream of error messages from X usually. So that's not something that's a success in any other case. Yeah, no, there's no point at which we want that. So I think it would probably have been fairly clear cut. But for instance, there's another problem I have right now where if we were only looking at the failure screenshot, that wouldn't work. And you probably would need this composite screenshot thing, which is an ingenious approach that I like. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just, I'm going back to, like, I experimented with the OCR. And the OCR had so many pro so many problems with identifying the text correctly. That yeah. was part of my suspicion, but it'd be worth trying. Like I said, more simpler, more better. Hey, but, so um, can you just go back to the experiment slide? Uh, like the experiment method, where you did like yeah, uh, the this the, the experiment the, design. Well, the grid search one, where you mentioned that you performed the grid. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. So uh, in the in the grid search, so uh, the way you did what like what I understand like for every hyperparameter combination you like trained the network using the training set and then yeah. got the, the accuracy or whatever using the test set and continued that for all your um, combinations and selected the best one based on the test set performance is it yes that is correct but like do you think like that that would kind of like overfit the like or influence your network or the results that's because Test set in general is supposed to be kept separate, and at the very end, you need to do that. So maybe a split of, let's say, a training, uh, validation, and test. So that at, at the very yeah. end, when you select the best hyperparameter, then you apply test at the very mm -hmm. final. Is no, you're correct. 
Um, and to be honest, this is, I didn't do this as formally as I could have. Um, if I was, you know, especially if I was trying to get this published, I would have to do that because you're right. Um, I'm kind of cheating. Um, <laughs> is a way to put it. Um, I think for this particular context, for the fact that we're not trying to produce something that's going to go into production, it's just a question of, you know, is there enough information in these screenshots to try and triage? For specifically that purpose, I think it doesn't matter. But you have a, very, you have a, you're correct. I should have done that. But does that answer your question? I, I'm not trying to say. I mean, it's, I think these results are valid, but. No, I think that I think that's valid. That's because you have got like quite quite a lot of like data points. So it essentially, it's unlikely to overfit, I guess. But I mean, and now that you mention it, I'm curious because I did record all of the. Um, I mean, if getting into more specific things, you know, within that 80%, I think I did another 80-20 split. So it's only using. For, so and I use that 20 for validation. I did record that those the results from the validation yeah. parts of it, and I. Now that you've mentioned it, I'm curious to see if it would have picked the same um, hyperparameter combination um, from the validation set versus the test set. Yeah, thanks. Does that make sense to everyone else, what I just said and what he was asking? Enough anyways? All right. <laughs> he basically pointed out that um, I, I there, were some there were some flaws. So there are some flaws in my approach um, that certainly would not pass muster. Um, if I was trying to get it published or something like that. Um, all right, getting back to, and I, I keep harping on this because I got some questions about, you know, when is this going to go into production? Um, and it, you know, again, getting back to, it's not going to go into production. It wasn't ever meant to go into production. This was an initial experiment. Um, and the idea was to, is there enough information in these screenshots to do triage just based on throwing them at a neural network? And I think that the answer is yes, it's, it's certainly possible um, and certainly worth uh, looking into. Um, so data and code. I forgot to push my code public because um, I found a bug last night in something that doesn't affect stuff, but I need to push that public. The data is available. It is a 50 gigabyte tarball. Um, that took four hours for my computer to compress down from 100 and, or, yeah, 108 to 50. So you're welcome to grab it. It is a lot of data. Um, and I can publish these slides afterwards. Um, if you would want to see the code sooner than I get around to pushing it, just come find me. I'm not trying to you know, hide it. It's just a trying to make sure it's correct before it gets pushed. Yeah? Hold on a second. Can you hold, wait up for the... So you said the conclusion is, uh, yeah, it's possible. Uh, so if I uh, would love to do new classifier to find the buses, uh, so like, yeah, initial run, a lot of investigation, but the second time when you want to uh, do a classifier for the buses, mm -hmm. how long it would take you and how much time it save you in during regular QE? The, the, fl the primary flaw in the approach that I've talked about is that it cannot scale. Um, in order to say, you know, say that, you know, Adam said there's, there's a new issue, it'd be nice to be able to, to detect. In order, the problem is creating the data set. Because in order for, you know, this kind of an approach to work, you have to have, you know, at least a thousand labeled instances of it happening. And then you know do all that kind of stuff. And if we're trying for every single issue to find a thousand examples so of it before we start recognizing it, so so how long take take you, or would take you to to, to create new data set for the buses? Um, that's a I'm, it's it's a hard question to answer. It depends on how quickly. You know how frequent the error is. Um, it, the, the, the long haul in the tent is the person who is going through marking things as, yes, this is related, no, this isn't. Um, so I don't know if I, am I misunderstanding your question? Uh, I, I have no idea, like, oh, okay. I, even the scale, like, is it minutes, days, weeks, years? <laughs> Again, it comes down to the issue. In terms of once the data set is created, it's going to be the same kind of process of, you know, say a day or two of exploring, you know, of computer time to explore the parameter space and then four minutes to train each would be my suspicion, assuming everything's about the same size. But the, 
the most expensive part of this has nothing, is not the neural network, it's not the time coding it, it is creating that data set. And so in order to get, you know, a thousand examples of that particular issue, however often it's happening, so say, you know, it happens 10 times a day, you, you know, you, it's going to be 100 days before you get a thousand examples. Um, and, you know, is, do you need a thousand examples? It, that's a hard question to answer. It depends on the issue, but it, what I'm trying to get at is the expensive part is the data set creation and, the, and collecting all of that. So let's, let's look at this from the perspective of recognizing um, failures that, mm -hmm. let's say we don't get them in OpenQA. We, we, we can look at the Fedora, a more general view on Fedora. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, we have uh, stack traces. And mm -hmm. we have a system that um, from the um, users' uh, systems uploads these stack traces and we have a collection of the stack traces. So, for example, this can be used if we marked a certain stack trace that this is real error. This, and we know a bug uh, that is associated with we can have the information uh, similar to that stack trace, mm -hmm. identified by similar uh, network run, uh, to be belonging to the same bug. Mm -hmm. So kind of um, how long would it take to achieve this? This is probably something that what Miro is asking. About. Before I answer the question you asked, I just want to answer a different question that was implied. Um, there is, a, that's a whole field of research in itself um, that is not terribly related to exactly what I talked about. Um, but to answer the, the question you asked, it, honestly, it starts getting a little outside of my, of my knowledge. Um, the problem with, honestly, every machine learning problem is data. And it's just kind of getting back to the data set. And is it how long? I don't, the, the reason I am taking, yeah, the mm. reason why I'm taking the stack traces as an example mm. because they are more confined and mm -hmm. easier to identify similar similarity there. Mm -hmm. uh, remember when, when all of this uh, GPT became sort of public, available mm -hmm. for experiments, but not really um, run in an open source fashion. What people did, they started looking into uh, stable division, uh, diffusion and, and similar um, net, network systems and started to convert um, other types of information into the visual. Mm -hmm. So effectively, um, the one thing, uh, the, the beginning of, of that story was that uh, they converted audio mm -hmm. into the uh, video, mm -hmm. uh, in, into the uh, um, pictures and ran uh, stable diffusion to generate something new with, with those audio and then convert it back to the audio. And this is effectively what I am implying here, mm -hmm. that we can take these stack traces, convert into um, pictures that you yeah. analyze, stack them together and run some sort of analyzer. If we know that this particular stack trace, for example, corresponds to the real problem that we already been getting uh, in past, and we have collection of those problems actually um, classified everywhere. We can take mm -hmm. that data mm -hmm. that al already associated with the solved bugs and uh, train the system with that to figure mm -hmm. out some sort of a similar stack trace happening. Mm -hmm. It's And apply that to the logs of OpenQA mm -hmm. when the crash actually happens. Um, one of the issues I at least noticed is that with OpenQA specifically, it doesn't always give you that in text form. Um, so like the crashes that it was seeing with X, it would show up on the screen, it would not show up in any of the text logs. Um, so yeah, getting back to, to, to what you had asked, I don't know, I, I mean it reminds me of uh, talking to someone who did some interesting research of trying to find malware by converting the bits in a binary to a bitmap and then running visual analysis on that. Um, it's a hammering of, of it because you're making a, a much harder, you're trying to solve a much harder problem for mm -hmm. 
something that could probably be solved much easier, but it mm. still uh, seemed to be where the direction yeah. of research is going to yep. today. And like I said, I, this, is, this is me, like this is outside of, of my exact realm of knowledge. My instinct is that because, I mean, if it were, I mean, it'd be worth trying. Um, but my instinct is that because it's more structured, more information retrieval techniques um, and less machine learning might be more effective because, like I said, the downfall of most machine learning problems is that you need 100 examples, you need 1,000 examples of the same thing before you can train it to find it. And in a lot of cases, by the time you have that many, the bug is fixed or it's no longer an issue. And either way, you know, finding someone to identify you know, 100 duplicates mm -hmm. would be difficult. So I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. It, it, Am I answering your question? It's, that, that yeah, is, you, that's an interesting way to do it. I don't question. know how possible, how likely it is to work. I'm, I'm just looking at this from the other perspective. So we hmm. have roughly upstreams, then um, downstreams like Fedora, mm -hmm. then downstreams like CentOS Stream, mm -hmm. then downstreams like RHEL, mm -hmm. which have a span of time before a certain thing comes in. Mm -hmm. So by the time uh, we missed something in QA, in RHEL. Mm -hmm. That problem for sure might have already been seen somewhere mm -hmm. upstream. Upstream meaning in Fedora and in real uh, upstream of that project. Mm -hmm. So if we could have had some sort of uh, analysis of, of these uh, problems we see in upstreams and in Fedora mm -hmm. done at that time to generate these kind of uh, data sets mm -hmm. and then reapply them downstreams, we might actually get uh, results mm. that we don't see now in, yeah. in RHEL QE or we don't see them in the actual um, support cases mm -hmm. and help there. Yeah. Because we see them maybe No, and that could, yeah, having, uh, in a way, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you were getting at, but having a way to fingerprint some of those uh, crashes to be able to identify them later, that, yeah. yeah. Just side note that if you want to look for the uh, um, traces from, uh, and compare it to different uh, issues already reported, we already have it. It's. Uh, it's part of ABRT, uh, FAF, FAF already do that, not based on AI, but mm. on the editing distance. Um, it was never too much popular, so, so if you want to dive into that, you can. It already exists. I'm using, I'm using this example, uh, the um, traces, just because people are aware of those. I'm using the traces example here just because people are aware about ABRT. But in reality, I would take fragments of the actual execution logs with the variation there, like SSSD logs or a journal with certain things, and focus on those, because they, these are the things that we analyze with support every day. And some of them span uh, a lot of uh, time in execution and you do match across multiple logs to, to find the actual problem. It's not in a single place. So extracting these, correlating them, and finding them this way seem to be a, a bit of promising. Um, I think Steph Walter did this a couple years ago with, um, with the co co cockpit. And they did find some promising results, but again, training and then reapplying the results fails because you, you never fit the same, find the same problem. While in maybe reapplying this across multiple distributions from upstream to downstream might give you actually a repeatability of the problem. That's the reality we see. Customers might see the same issue again and again in downstream 12 to 18 months later after we probably solved this problem uh, in the upstream. And this gives you a chance to actually catch something that you forgot to backport, for example. Yeah. That's, that's my point. Maybe mm -hmm. this is a real value here. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about this more, um, but I have five minutes left and 
we'll see if I get through everything. Uh, I should be able to. Um, so, you know, getting into, it was an experiment. It was never meant to go into production, so what can we do with this? Can we, you know, make something out of it? Um, from what I understand, and Adam, this is a, from a conversation we had, um, something that is possible that I, we want to take for, that I want to take for the next step is, can we take those open QA failures and start grouping them by root cause? Um, and so that, you know, you don't have to have so much, again, trying to revisit this whole thing of making people who are doing the triage work more effective. It takes less of their time because they have other things they need to be doing um, rather than just, you know, triaging the same thing over and over again. Yeah. I think the, the value is not so much about taking up people's time. Um, it's more the, so the, the Adam W restart bot runs, you know, maybe every two hours during the day, and then there are these eight hour intervals where I have to go sleep. And that means that if your update is blocked on one of these failures, you might be waiting eight hours before it gets restarted. If we can do something like this, then your update will get restarted immediately, and then we cut out that latency. That's well, I'm the, talking about more general. So yeah, not, not just general. does it need to be restarted as in can you, you know, can we change open QA so that, you know, there's some suggestions of these fail these five failures look very similar. Yeah. You know, and trying to group things by root cause of failure, yeah. not just does it need to be reset. Yeah, that could be very, that could be helpful for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's definitely worth looking down. And I think the the thing that we have to look at is the whole pro question of how long does it take to get enough data together to classify yep. things versus how long do problems exist? But there are, I mean, the X thing lasted for several weeks. This 404 thing has been going on for a couple of weeks now, so. Yeah, and like I'm talking about something completely different. This, this is related and not. Um, so the, but the idea is, yeah. It's still the same thing because the root causes tend to come and go in batches, right? It's not always the same ones. But uh, one of the things that, um, I'm sorry to tell you, I'm just trying to make sure I finish my slot, finish before uh, time's up. Um, the, there's a system out there called Tango. Um, it's been published in research. Basically, it was developed to try and find duplicate results from screen captures of mobile apps. Um, and it used video and text to try and find duplicates within its data set. Um, it's something I do want to look at, because um, I think it's promising. It's related enough to be worth looking at. Um, but, you know, as I'm repeating myself for the 50th time, the problem is data. Um, modern machine learning stuff needs a lot of data. Um, we have only so many expert hours and only so many emails to said experts before they start ignoring my emails um, and never talking to me again. So um, it's, you know, a question of this is the real cost. You know, in, is, are the, does this, is this going to look promising enough to spend the time to create the data set to do more research? Um, but one of the things that I also want to look at is a technique called active learning. Um, and, well, I call it a technique, it, an approach called the active learning. Um, and the idea is instead of sending every single sample to an expert to an annotate, um, analyze what your data first and organize things such that you are using them minimally um, so that you can um, you know, gain the most amount of information from the least amount of expert time. Um, and that's, uh, so the idea is from here to look at Tango, to look at active learning so that we can minimize the amount of time uh, that we need from experts um, and hopefully find something that can start grouping those failures by uh, root cause um, with enough confidence that it doesn't end up being noise. So just repeating the, the conclusion, it's promising, but it, uh, in my opinion, but it is only beginning. And going forward, it's going to start getting expensive. Um, one of the things I do want to harp on is, uh, and I'm leading into this, all of the um, work that I did was on an Ubuntu machine. Um, because this stuff does not run well, if at all, on Fedora. Um, and we can get into a whole bunch of stuff about why um, and what can be done. Um, there is kind of a solution coming up that someone's working on basically the replacement for, for NVIDIA Docker. You used to be able to um, pass the GPU through to the, the container and have all of NVIDIA's proprietary crap in that container um, and run it on Fedora that way. We stopped shipping Docker. Um, the replacement that can use Podman, I think someone's working on packaging it. 
Um, but that's a lead up to if you also don't like the fact that this all had to be done on Ubuntu, um, we're working on stuff to fix that. Um, and maybe you should show up for the, there's a, um, at 4.30 in the room next door, um, we're gonna do some of a, a meet up to, to start talking about some of the stuff and what we're doing to fix it. I think I'm out of time, but questions, comments? I guess if you have, um, I am out of time. If you have questions or comments, please come find me. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, and thank you for all of you who are here in the Fedora Leads, the Linux distribution development room. Um, we will be picking up again in five more minutes. And if you are on your way out for a moment, there is a badge uh, sign on the back desk there. Please stop by and get your flock badge. If you haven't already, you can scan the QR code. So I just want to remind everybody for that. So we'll be picking up here in about five more minutes.